Hi, and welcome to our Digging Deeper series as we look a little bit more closely at each one of the chapters of the book of Daniel. We'll talk about some of the things that are unique in the chapter or to look out as you're studying for, as well as equip you with some tools to continue to sharpen your own skills as you study God's Word. So we find ourselves now in Daniel chapter 8, and this is a really, really difficult chapter, notoriously difficult. There's a lot of things in it that kind of can push the interpretation a few different ways. So I want to talk about some of the interpretive issues within the text or things that are important to note, and we're going to wrap together some of our skills that we've been talking about, um, skills in our observation, how we read the text, uh, interpretation, what do we see about the text, our correlation, how do we uh, connect it with other things, be it within the chapter, the book, uh, the whole context of scripture or even beyond, and then finally application. Now we're continuing to look at correlation, and last time we talked about correlation within a theological framework, particularly a Christological framework of reading the text, but I want uh, to narrow Daniel chapter 8 to talk to uh, us about how we correlate between the chapters, and Daniel 8 is an excellent um, passage for us to do this with because it has so much overlap and yet differences at the same time with previous chapters uh, in the book of Daniel and that's going to be really critical for us to to be able to study and interpret it and ultimately apply it well in our own lives. So hopefully you've watched the message. If you haven't, please go ahead and um, check that out. It'll give a good overview. But I want to note a couple of things as you're reading through and studying Daniel chapter 8. Um, first of all, watch the time marker here because this is going to be a little bit unusual for us. Um, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel. Now that should make us pause and think and go, oh, wait a minute, we're kind of jumping around in time here because we have already seen Belshazzar before. And Belshazzar, uh, it didn't turn out well for him. It was the writing on the wall. He was killed. His kingdom was dismantled. So something's going on here that's different from a timestamp. And see, even our correlation right now helps us go, oh, wait a minute. I've read this before. We're going back in time. That's going to be significant for us. Um, another clue that you won't uh, pick up on it necessarily of just reading in the English, but we're really shifting most of the narrative at this point is going from Aramaic, a language that would have been spoken um, in that time, to Hebrew. So even the structure of the book is actually in two separate languages, and, and we're shifting in that as well. That should also key us up to go, okay, something different is going on here. And hold on to that because we'll come back to that. A um, couple things we'll note in this chapter. This is dealing with beasts as well, which we've also seen before. If you remember previously in Daniel, um, we saw a different beast that arose out of sort of the primordial muck and um, very terrifying creatures. Uh, when you go back and read it, they're pretty aggressive. Um, they seem to have a moral connotation to it. This is different. Uh, I encourage you, read through that chapter of the beasts, then read through this chapter of the beast. So some similarities that we find is, well, we've got overlap between them. Um, we do have uh, these creatures who are representing some sort of nations, but they're not cast in the exact same way. Um, these creatures in Daniel chapter 8, we really have a goat and a ram. And while they are aggressive, uh, we would kind of read that to be natural. In fact, you don't see much about uh, their creation. You don't really even see much about a moral component to them. It's just represented as here's these beastly powers that represent these uh, global leaders and these nations, and they're in a contest, and ultimately it's going to have a, a tiered effect on God's people. And so, um, but it's not really about where the nations are going to end up. A really interesting thing that you'll note in this that should inform us is thinking too about this, this fourth beast that was around. Um, this fourth beast that has come through uh, in the earlier chapters was terrifying, couldn't be described, uh, raised its head up against God, and, and really it was this kind of end times apocalyptic end of all uh, the rise and fall of nations. This is actually just the goat and the ram and some of the persecution for God's people that's going to come out of that. Um, so note the differences as you go back and forth because it's going to highlight something for us. So then it should raise this question as you're studying the Bible, why are these beasts different? 
Why are they choosing different representations in earlier chapters? And why is there no fourth beast and kind of an, an end time apocalyptic flair to it like we've seen earlier? Well, because this is focused on what is going to happen specifically to God's people. See, the earlier chapters are concerned with giving this big overarching narrative of what's happening in the rise and fall of nations throughout history. And so it does have this grandiose um, history sweeping arc to it where this focuses in on, okay, well, how are these middle stages, um, particularly between Persia and Greece, not even talking Roman Empire or beyond, how are these going to affect God's people and how do they need to be prepared in order to uh, navigate this well? How can they prepare themselves for the trials that lie ahead? And that kind of makes sense when you think, okay, well now this part of the book is written in Hebrew. Obviously, this wasn't meant for a wide readership amongst the court where Daniel was living. This was particular revelation to help stabilize and, and uh, give confidence to God's people that even though trials lie ahead, that God will still be um, operative. Um, so we, we have kind of a very different emphasis on our vision of the beast. We're still using a motif of animals to represent kingdoms and future rulers, but the purpose of it is much, much more particular and much, much more time bound. So in the message, um, I trace this to be um, with Greece, the collapse of Greece and um, the rise of Antiochus Epiphanes. And really, if you're interested in reading more about that in the Maccabean revolution uh, that resulted, uh, check out the book of Maccabees. You can read plenty of things about it online uh, to give kind of um, a different perspective on how this actually played out in history and how God's people um, survived in it and how God showed up uniquely um, in that. And so Daniel chapter eight, as you're studying, uh, I want you to think in terms of how does this fit into the overall structure of this book, right? We've already thought, how does this fit into maybe a, a Christological, theological understanding of the Bible? But we also want to correlate what we're reading with what we've read before. And we do that in lots of literature. You know, when you read the last chapter of Harry Potter, it somehow connects back to uh, a creature or a person or an event in chapter one that somehow comes back and is, you know, the saving grace of everything at the end of the book, right? We're, we're used to connecting those dots. Sometimes we're not as good about thinking about it in that sense with the biblical text, but it certainly is something that's important for us to keep in mind. And this chapter illustrates it really well. Now, let me come back to the timestamp. Why does this matter? All right, when you think of the timing and think of, this is kind of a depressing chapter, to be honest. Um, it's not a lot of, you know, God's going to show up. It's going to be amazing. It, it's kind of a, I need you to be prepared. This is going to be hard. And here's some um, apocalyptic uh, imagery um, that's going to apply to a specific time for, for the people of God. And I need you to be prepared. Our first thought in this kind of mirrors what Daniel's response is at the end, which was, I was sick to my stomach and don't even know how to process this. But when you go back and you correlate the timestamp on this, what's amazing to me is that this happens all the way back. We're, we're going back in time here. Um, Daniel's recounting this to the early times of, of Belshazzar, a time when Daniel had frankly been mothballed from, from leadership and influence positions after his time with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, which makes sense given the political upheaval and um, all that had happened in Babylon up until that point. But still, I mean, probably at the low point of his influence in a long time with the king that's very hedonistic, um, that's committing a lot of sacrilege and uh, really doesn't seem to have an ounce of sense on him if he's throwing a party while he's being sieged by an army. Okay, and Daniel, right before those events of the writing on the wall, gets this vision. And, and part of why correlation really helps us is because it helps us even think through what did Daniel go through and how did he apply this, even as we think through our own application to go, you know, visions of the end can actually give you an incredible amount of strength to continue forward uh, knowing that God has it at hand. Knowing the future doesn't always mean you know it's going to be pretty. In fact, a lot of times you, you realize it's going to not be, and God's Word attests to that. And yet... It also attests to the, the fact that it does give a confidence that God is in control. And Daniel took that and made some very bold statements to a very young and brash 
irrational king um, and was greatly rewarded for it and God's name was lifted up because of it. So really track, try not just to think chapter to chapter, but compare Daniel chapter 8 uh, to earlier chapters of the beast. Go ahead and take some notes as to what are the differences and why might the setting, uh, the timestamp, and the audience that's receiving it account for some of those differences and in- help us as we interpret what we understand. Um, good luck reading down chapter eight. There's a lot of different opinions on it. Um, I encourage you don't just look at one, uh, kind of read broadly to see what people are saying and um, practice your skills of Coraline as we study God's word together. I look forward to seeing you next time in our Digging Deeper series.